Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I will be talking about uh, models of interacting brain regions at uh, cellular resolution, so uh, biological neural network models with a focus on uh, large-scale models. Um, because most of you don't uh, do neural network modeling, as I understood, uh, I will first go into some basics, and um, then I'll give an example of a small-scale network model um, to illustrate how uh, such types of models can be used to study neurological conditions um, with an example of tinnitus, which are uh, phantom sensations of sound. Uh, then I'll go into why it may be useful to um, study large-scale models as well, and uh, finally give some examples of such models and ending with uh, the model, um, a multi-area model of macaque visual cortex that we are developing. Um, so what do you think uh, could be some advantages of um, studying models at cellular resolution as opposed to population models that represent the activity of entire populations of neurons with uh, one or a few variables? See if you can uh, guess the uh, reasons that I came up with. <laughs> you can probably modulate the activity of neurons on a more finer scale. So you could probably try to model activity of things like neurotransmitters or um, receptors and stuff like that, so more fine grain resolution. Yeah, I think that's kind of uh, similar to. Uh, um, so. Yeah, it facilitates uh, the investigation of influence of uh, single neuron and synaptic properties. So the, um, the parameters of such models often have a direct um, physiological interpretation. Mm, what else? The advantage of the shape of neurons, like the dendrites and such things. Right, okay, yeah, that's an additional one that I don't have on my slide. <laughs> It allows uh, using more complex uh, topology structures and whatever that are not reducible to an uh, analytical formula. That's true as well. Um, do I have it here? <laughs> yeah, not so much. But um, so maybe, um, well, this is a related point. So it enables model validation with single neuron data and by the same token, um, it, it doesn't assume a correspondence between the, the single neuron dynamics and population level uh, a priori. It allows it to be tested. Yep. Mm. So other uh, reasons are that um, with such models, you can uh, study synchrony. So normally, um, when you have um, a mean field model, then uh, an assumption is that all the neurons are firing independently uh, of each other, and it doesn't capture synchrony. Um, yeah, so, so a mean field model um, is like a, it represents the average activity of a, a lot of neurons that are assumed to have independent activity. And um, another reason is that uh, with such models you can capture uh, so plasticity and computational properties that depend on spike timing. So. Uh, like uh, uh, STDP, spike timing dependent plasticity. Um, just another uh, basic point about modeling in general, but also for uh, neural network models, is that you should always try to avoid overfitting. Um, so um, overfitting is that when you use um, too many parameters, so the, um, the fit you make, uh, it, it fits the data points that you have very well, but it doesn't uh, allow generalization to new points. So this is illustrated here uh, with an example from classification. So this green line here, um, it, um, it perfectly uh, separates these blue and uh, red regions, but you can imagine that if you um, sample additional data points, that, uh, that this black line is a better predictor of um, on which side that point will fall. Um, and the same for, uh, holds for regression problems. So you can uh, fit a line through all the data points and that line would have uh, a lot of parameters, but um, uh, when you look at a new data point or you assume that there is some noise in the data, then the straight line is a better predictor. Um, this is um, 
schematically indicated here that uh, when you add more parameters to a model, you can uh, continually um, decrease the, um, the training error, so the, so the goodness of fit to the data that you have increases all the time, but there's a minimum in the validation error, so there's an optimal um, size of your model in terms of the number of parameters for predicting new data. And uh, it's, it's difficult to determine this point in, in practice, so, but some rules of thumb are that um, you should just use parameters that are well determined, so the values are uh, well known, or that seem relevant to the problem at hand that you want to investigate the influence of, for instance, uh, and reduce uh, the number of further parameters to a minimum. Um, uh, in practice, it's, it's difficult to do because um, you may want to use some um, available model of which you know the behavior, a behavior that you want your model to exhibit. So maybe it's inevitable normally to, uh, to have some additional parameters, but you should uh, not use too many <laughs> if possible. Um, and of course, uh, basic point of science to make predictions and, and test them with, uh, with new data. So um, uh, you can also, if you don't have new data, you can still uh, test whether you are overfitting by uh, leaving out part of the data underlying the model and see how ro uh, robust your predictions are, or adding noise, for instance, on the order of the uncertainty in the data and see how sensitive you, your predictions are to that. Um, when you uh, make a neural network model, there's a whole zoo of neuron models to uh, choose from, the simplest ones uh, being point neurons. And, um, Within that category, a very simple model is a binary model, or there are several types of binary neuron models, in fact, um, and they take uh, one of two, uh, they assume one of two states, just uh, you can call them zero and one, with um, transitions between these states that depend on the external uh, input to the neurons. Um, there's no uh, direct uh, relation to spiking in such models, but still they can be useful for predicting things like correlations between neurons. Um, another simple type of model is a, a phase oscillator model, the most famous example being the Kuramoto uh, oscillator, so they represent the, um, the state of a neuron just by a phase, and so this is useful when uh, individual neurons uh, oscillate or uh, when you want to study synchronization of uh, networks. Um, yeah, a well-known type of neuron uh, that you probably know is the Hodgkin-Huxley type. It uh, represents the spikes explicitly uh, using uh, sodium and potassium uh, currents and they can contain uh, any type of additional uh, currents. Um, then there's a spike response model. Um, I've never uh, worked with it myself, but um, they don't um, use differential equations to, um, to specify the shape of the spike, but uh, um, define the shape of the spike explicitly. Um, there are also map models that are not so commonly used that um, use discrete time, so they use uh, difference equations rather than differential equations. And then uh, ones that we also use, um, integrate and fire neuron models. There's a leaky integrate and fire model, uh, quadratic, adaptive exponential, and then more recently the multi-timescale adaptive threshold model. Um, so this is an example uh, trace of uh, what the leaky integrate and fire model does for a constant current input. When the current is a uh, sub-threshold, then the membrane potential goes exponentially to a fixed value. Um, when the current is um, supra-threshold, then um, a spike is assumed to occur at a specific threshold level. So the spike shape is not uh, modeled explicitly. We just uh, say that when the threshold membra membrane potential is reached, then we say there is a spike. Um, and then you can go, um, arbitrarily more complicated and use few, few compartment models or multi-compartment models, for instance, if uh, dendritic properties are important, if you have active dendrites or so. 
So how to choose a neuron model? Uh, similarly to what I uh, said before, um, you should, it should be as simple as possible, but of course not simpler. Uh, you need to, um, of course it needs to display the behavior that you, you want it to display. Um, and as, uh, as I mentioned, if, uh, if there are dendritic nonlinearities, then you need a dendritic compartment uh, separate from the somatic compartment. Um, simple models facilitate analytical treatment. So for instance, for the binary uh, neuron model and the leak integrating fire model, there's a mean field theory available, and that helps to uh, understand the behavior of such networks in a more systematic uh, way because they're just much lower dimensional, easier to understand. And um, then you may want to um, you want your neurons to uh, display bursting behavior or, or low threshold spiking, or so depending on that, you'd also need to choose an appropriate neuron model. Um, there is, uh, in 2008, 2009, there was a, a so-called single neuron modeling competition. Um, and uh, traces of um, uh, membrane potentials uh, from experiments where the inputs uh, were known, so there were in, uh, in vivo-like currents or spike trains. Um, and uh, the winner from uh, 2009 was the multi-timescale adaptive threshold model. So this is like, a, it's an integrated fire model, but uh, instead of uh, resetting the membrane potential after every spike, it, uh, it changes the, the threshold. And uh, the behavior or the result in terms of spiking is similar to that for an integrated fire model, but the advantage is that the sub-threshold dynamics remains uh, linear. So these models can be uh, solved exactly and uh, also rapidly. Um, this, this was the winner for only part of the competition because there was also another part where the uh, dendritic membrane potential had to be predicted separately from the somatic one and the um, point neuron model cannot do that. Um, so this model was introduced by Kobayashi and colleagues and um, later it was extended by Yamauchi uh, um, but here, these uh, spiking behaviors shown are for the Kobayashi model. So both types of model have, um, have the advantage that they capture a lot of different spiking behaviors with only few parameters. So for instance here, so it's tonic spiking, um, adaptation, um, the, they can be class one excitable or class two excitable, so that means that they can uh, start spiking at arbitrarily low frequencies, or they start spiking at a certain finite frequency, etc. So um, um, I mentioned that this MAT model um, can be integrated uh, exactly and also rapidly, so that could be another factor, especially when you go to large-scale models. You want your neurons to be able to, you want to be able to integrate them fast. Um, and it's an advantage if the neurons are available in standard simulators such as NEST um, because, um, well, it's faster, you don't have to implement it yourself, but also you avoid any uh, bugs, programming bugs, or any. Uh, these models are used by lots of people and they've been tested um, extensively and it also helps uh, reproducibility that you can say, I've used exactly this model and someone else can reproduce it. <clears throat> um, besides the neuron model, uh, you also need to choose a particular model for the, for the synapses. And a basic uh, distinction there is between current-based and conductance-based synapses. So if we have this uh, uh, leaky integrated and fire neuron model, the equation is uh, like this. So the, the membrane potential, um, this is the capacitance the membrane, and then uh, you have the leak current, the synaptic current, and uh, possibly also an injected current or some external drive. And um, uh, the leak current is, is given by this, so this is uh, uh, the leak conductance and uh, the leak reversal potential. In this case, it's, it's also the resting membrane potential. Um, and for current-based synapses, the uh, synaptic current is just um, 
some uh, summation of, uh, so th these are current amplitudes here, and then uh, you have the, the incoming uh, spikes, um, or, the, or uh, the shape of the incoming uh, um, PSCs, uh, so the postsynaptic currents. Um, and for conductance-based synapses, uh, you additionally have this uh, dependence on the membrane potential. So that makes uh, subsequent inputs some uh, non-linearly, whereas for current-based synapses, they sum uh, linearly. Um, and um, all synapses are, in a way, uh, conductance-based. So locally, they're always conductance-based. There is this dependence on the, uh, on the membrane potential. But the question is, when you use a point neuron model, whether you should use uh, current-based or conductance-based synapses, um, because um, those conductance and voltage changes due to synaptic inputs are, to some extent, local. And uh, the membrane potential equation for um, a point neuron model uh, describes a somatic membrane potential. Um, and so we need to know what is the influence at the soma, actually. And um, excitatory inputs usually um, um, target dendritic spines. And um, those have like a little spine neck and a head, so the neck is a little bit narrow. And these uh, spines compartmentalize uh, voltage and conductance changes and uh, linearize the uh, effect at the cell body. So this illustrated here in an experiment, uh, I think it was rat slices. Um, so uh, there are two synapses that are nearby each other in the same dendrit dendritic branch. And the average uh, um, PSP for uh, the one synapse is, is this, and for the other it's this, measured at the soma. And, um, and black is a linear prediction and it matches the sum of the two when, when both are activated very well. Um, but so when excitatory inputs uh, come or target the shafts, then you have um, more sublinear summation. So here's the, the linear prediction in this case. And um, the actual response when both are activated is below that. So in this case, there, there are conductance-based effects at the soma and in this case, um, a current-based uh, model would be appropriate. Uh, so in, it's actually somewhere in between, and a uh, point neuron model cannot capture both at the same time. Um, and inhibitory synapses generally target shafts, so they would have more conductance-based effects than excitatory ones. Um, so now I'll go into uh, an example of a neural network model uh, of tinnitus. Um, so tinnitus are auditory perceptions such as buzzing or ringing in the ears or head in the absence of corresponding uh, stimuli. It can actually be uh, pretty much any annoying sound that you can think of like hissing or whistling or buzzing. Yeah, buzzing is mentioned here. So. Um, and a lot of people suffer from it. I've also uh, had it myself. <laughs> um, roughly 10 to 15% of uh, adults have prolonged or recurrent uh, tinnitus. And it's often associated with hearing loss. For instance, if, there's a, if you've been exposed to a very loud uh, sound, by, like a gunshot, or, um, or it can be associated with uh, age-related high-frequency hearing loss or hearing loss in general. Um, and while there are peripheral, there can be peripheral changes in the peripheral auditory system, um, there are uh, usually central changes in uh, lots of uh, structures of the, uh, the auditory system, like in the brainstem, um, the cochlear nucleus, the, the superior olivaria complex, the inferior colliculus, then also in the auditory thalamus and in the auditory cortex, uh, which there's not only primary auditory cortex, there are several areas there. Uh, and in addition, the, the limbic system uh, tends to be affected, so there are lots of uh, emotional aspects of, uh, of tinnitus because it's very annoying and people start uh, 
being desperate to, to get rid of it. And so there are also changes in the limbic system. Um, and uh, the electrophysiological changes in these structures um, include changes in firing rates that have been observed uh, uh, subcortically. Um, there's, uh, there are changes in tonotopic maps in cortex. So um, tonotopic maps are sort of orderly spatial arrangements of the receptive, auditory receptive fields of neurons in terms of uh, which frequency of sound they respond to the most. So this is illustrated here. You see that um, the map is uh, approximately on a logarithmic scale. So um, here, this, this is a, a logarithmic scale. Um, so a certain uh, distance in cortical space corresponds to a certain number of octaves, if you will. And um, these, these changes, um, so when you have, uh, when people have high frequency hearing loss, there's um, a region of um, auditory cortex that still receives uh, a lot of input, and then there's the next region that receives uh, reduced input, and between them you have um, sort of um, a transition region, and there's, there tends to be um, over-representation of frequencies near this uh, hearing loss edge. Um, there's also, there are changes in firing patterns, like uh, enhanced uh, bursting in subcortical structures. Um, and then with MEG or EEG, uh, there are changes in the oscillations that are, are, are seen, like excessive delta and theta activity and gamma activity and reduced alpha. So uh, I see here, for instance, uh, the dashed line is for uh, controls and the um, solid line for tinnitus. And in tinnitus patients, there's increased uh, power at uh, low frequencies and reduced power um, at alpha. And this is another experiment, also um, EEG, where these uh, localized gamma hotspots were found um, in, uh, over auditory cortex. And uh, finally, there's increased synchrony between um, auditory cortex neurons, that's especially in the reorganized region. Um, and the model that I will talk about uh, tries to um, capture some of this. It's a very simple model, just um, 200 neurons. They use the uh, Fitzhugh Rinzel bursting neuron. It's an adaptation of the more well known Fitzhugh Nagumo uh, model. And it has um, two fast variables, uh, V and W, that uh, describe the, the spikes, and then a slower variable, Y, that um, determines the transition between bursting and uh, the interburst uh, intervals. And um, there are uh, synaptic inputs, S, from within the model, and then uh, an external drive can be represented by F here. Um, and the connectivity of the model is like this. So here you, you have the, um, yeah, the synaptic inputs from other neurons. The, the corresponding synaptic weights. Uh, and this is a Mexican hat uh, kernel, so uh, it describes the connectivity with uh, uh, short range excitation and long range inhibition. And um, yeah, these, uh, these synapses are modeled as, as conductance based. Um, these um, currents I are uniformly uh, distributed. And so in the absence of input, in the absence of coupling, um, the neurons have different um, natural frequencies. And they, so there's a broad distribution of, uh, of uh, interburst uh, frequencies that they fire at. And uh, they, they are, uh, are active independently. This is just illustrated for, for two neurons here in the green and blue. And uh, when you have strong coupling between the neurons, then uh, they synchronize and they all start to fire at the same frequency. And that's illustrated here, just for two neurons. This uh, red trace is uh, the sum of the synaptic inputs in the, in the whole uh, network, and they take it to be a proxy for the local field potential, the LFP. Um, next, they introduced spike time independent plasticity with um, sort of standard uh, window function for SCDP. That is, um, 
when the postsynaptic neuron spikes after the presynaptic one, then there is a, a, a potentiation of the corresponding synapse. And uh, if the presynaptic neuron fires after the postsynaptic one, then there's depression. And there's a wider window for depression that's also observed experimentally. Um, they uh, use an upper bound for the synaptic weights to prevent runaway plasticity, so the, the weights to become uh, excessive. And uh, they use an opposite SDDP rule for distant in uh, inhibitory uh, connections, which uh, may be realistic or not, I'm not uh, sure. Um, then um, uh, they ensure that uh, connections between synchronously spiking neurons are strengthened and between independently spiking neurons are weakened, so that's, all, that's, that's realistic. Um, then, uh, depending on the initial synaptic weights, there are two different uh, states that emerge. So there's a synchronized state with high rates and a desynchronized one with uh, low rates. So the, the synchronized one is associated with high average uh, synaptic weights as uh, shown here, and then this uh, LFP proxy that they use shows large oscillations. You can, um, yeah, that, that corresponds to synchronous spiking, and uh, this is the desynchronized state. And in uh, each of these states, uh, um, they, they settle at different patterns of synaptic weights that are somewhat, uh, th they're due to the neurons uh, being uh, on a ring in effectively, so they're um, um, circular boundary conditions. So this is for the desynchronized state and for the, oh sorry, the other way around, the synchronized and the desynchronized one. Um, next they um, add external input um, in the form of uh, spatially correlated Poisson spike trains. Um, does everyone know what Poisson spike trains are? Who, who doesn't know? Ah, okay. So, um, the um, Poisson spike trains are just um, uh, trains of spikes uh, for which uh, each spike is independent. So there's a constant rate in each interval. There's a constant probability for a spike to occur. And uh, that leads to irregular uh, spike trains with an exponential distribution of interspike intervals. Some are, so, uh, uh, yeah, okay, I hope that was clear. Um, <coughs> then um, they, they model a noise trauma by, by uh, transiently having an uh, increased uh, input, and uh, that uh, leads to increased weight. So at this point, they turn the input on, and then, um, uh, let's see. What, um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> the, so the, the, these are the mean synaptic weights and, and they go up. Uh, the noise trauma is assumed to occur only in, in, part, of the, uh, in part of the network. Um, and then um, a longer term uh, effect of the noise trauma is actually deafferentation. So first, uh, the neurons in that region with the noise trauma um, synchronize. Uh, then they, um, um, then the um, external drive is removed from that uh, part, and um, they remain uh, they re remain synchronized. But the part that uh, gets uh, normal input again, that desynchronizes because the external drive is uh, is stochastic. Um, so y you end up with this uh, region of synchrony and a region of uh, desynchronized activity, which is more uh, like healthy activity. <clears throat> um, yeah, they, they go on to, uh, to model what happens when you stimulate with coordinated uh, reset stimulation, as they call it. Um, um, I will not uh, go into that uh, now, but I'll uh, continue to why uh, it's useful to model large-scale networks. 
So I just uh, I stick to, to cortex because that's what I study. Uh, one reason is that, that areas cooperate with each other. So there's this um, well-known uh, theory of predictive <coughs> coding, for instance, uh, where you have sensory inputs to, uh, to areas like uh, primary visual cortex, and uh, they send uh, uh, feed-forward uh, activation to higher order areas. The higher areas uh, represent um, predictions. They send the predictions to the lower area. The lower area uh, sort of compares it with the input and then computes a, a prediction error and forwards that. And this can go on uh, several stages in the hierarchy. Um, it's just, uh, it's one theory about how um, progressively more complex uh, concepts are, um, are encoded in, in sensory cortices and beyond. Um, and similarly, when you have the visual hierarchy, you have primary visual cortex, the cells there are uh, responsive to, uh, to oriented bars in small parts, in particular places in the visual field. Uh, they're called simple cells, and then the inputs from different uh, simple cells can be uh, combined to um, have neurons that are complex cells that are responsive to oriented bars, uh, but in a larger portion of the visual field. And then um, combined inputs from several complex cells can lead to uh, receptive fields that, cons that uh, contain different orientations and so forth, and up to complex uh, shapes. Um, so this, this occurs in a, in a hierarchy of areas. Um, another reason uh, to consider large-scale models is that there's uh, collective dynamics. So for instance, um, in local cortical circuits, uh, you can account for, uh, for high-frequency activity, gamma activity. Um, but there's also, uh, uh, there are also uh, low frequencies um, that arise due to the interaction between multiple areas and, um, and these slow oscillations can in turn influence the, the local oscillations, for instance, when, when gamma occurs at a particular phase of the, of the slow oscillation. Um, so this collective dynamics is also seen um, in fMRI resting state activity, so those are um, uh, networks that uh, uh, there are groups of areas that uh, uh, that are active in a correlated uh, manner, and the activation fluctuation fluctuates on a slow time scale between these uh, groups of areas. And uh, so the resting state is a state where uh, where the animal doesn't uh, perform any task and doesn't receive any particular uh, sensory stimulation. Um, then there are links to experiment. So um, if, you, if you want to make a link to mesoscopic or macroscopic uh, measurement modalities, then you would need to uh, model the corresponding uh, surface areas. So for instance, mesoscopic measures like the local field potential, voltage sensitive dye uh, imaging, um, they uh, sample the activity on a range of uh, um, uh, uh, around 100 micrometers to several uh, millimeters. And then there are the really macroscopic measures like uh, EEG, uh, so electroencephalo <laughs> electroencephalography, magnetoencephalography, and uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So this would, uh, should work in two ways. So on the one hand, uh, uh, if you model a large-scale network, you can use such uh, measurement modalities to constrain your model, and at the same time you can uh, provide insight into uh, the underlying mechanisms for these measures. Um, and then there's a reason for, um, for modeling networks at the full density of neurons and, uh, and synapses that I've uh, investigated. So uh, very commonly, sorry, <laughs> um, Neuron, so neural network models are uh, downscaled in terms of the numbers of uh, neurons and synapses. Um, as you saw before, there were only 200 uh, neurons in that model. 
uh, for um, computational reasons to, uh, to not use too much computer memory or, or time. Um, but um, this can never uh, preserve all the dynamical properties of a, of a system. So for instance, um, reduce, it's well known that reducing the number of neurons tends to increase correlations in networks, which you can uh, understand intuitively by considering that uh, a fluctuation um, in a smaller network has a relatively larger influence uh, on other neurons in the network than in a large network. So, um, and what we discovered is that um, it's impossible to simultaneously preserve the mean activities and the correlations between neurons um, beyond a certain level of downscaling. Uh, and correlations are relevant because, uh, for instance, they, uh, they are related to uh, task performance as illustrated with this experiment that um, there were two uh, neurons recorded in uh, hippocampal uh, CA1 region of a rat performing an auditory or visual discrimination task, and the task-related correlation was seen only for the visual task. So um, if you want to uh, preserve such properties of the, uh, of the network, uh, then it makes sense to uh, model the full complement of neurons and synapses that are there in the natural system. And this besides um, the more general point that if you want to test how good approximation is that by downscaling, then you would need to compare it to the full-scale network. So uh, now for some examples of such uh, large-scale models, the, uh, some uh, well-known ones. One is by uh, Hill and Tononi from 2005. It's called uh, Modeling Sleep and Wakefulness in the Thalamocortical System. They modeled uh, a network consisting of uh, two cortical areas, so the primary visual and um, a sort of generic higher visual area. The, and, um, and corresponding thalamic sectors <coughs> um, with the reticular uh, nuclei and, um, and uh, relay nuclei. Um, and uh, it's, for that time, it was rather large scale, so it uh, contains uh, uh, 65,000 uh, Hodgkin-Huxley-like spiking neurons with 5 million synapses. Uh, it's a complex model. It, uh, they have uh, NMDA, AMPA, GABA-A, GABA-B receptors, uh, synaptic depression, spontaneous activity due to uh, so-called mini, so spontaneous synaptic releases, and, um, and also some stochastic input that is uh, assumed to correspond to spontaneous firing uh, the optic nerve. Um, the neurons in this uh, primary visual region uh, are selective for horizontal and vertical bars. And then in the secondary uh, one, um, they're also, uh, they have the similar type of selectivity, but in addition, they can be selective for uh, bar crossings and they have larger receptive fields. Um, and the implementation was in a, a simulator that they wrote themselves and uh, it was rather slow. Um, what the, the model can do, so this is an illustration of how you can uh, test the influence of a uh, um, single neuron or even uh, properties or ionic channels. So um, an increase in the potassium leak conductance triggers a transition from wakefulness to sleep in this model. So in, in wakefulness, the activity is uh, asynchronous irregular, and then um, as they um, increase this potassium leak conductance, then these uh, slow oscillations occur. So in sleep, this kind of slow wave uh, thalamocortical oscillations are observed. And that's uh, sort of illustrated that uh, individual neurons also follow this oscillation. Um, and um, they also investigated, so what is the dependence of the initiation and the maintenance of these uh, so-called upstates, so these slow oscillations, they're oscillations between upstates with high activity and downstates with almost vanishing activity. Um, and so the, they looked at which currents uh, initiate the upstates, maintain them, and terminate them. And uh, not only currents, but also synaptic depression helps terminate the upstate. And um, 
cortical-cortical connections uh, synchronize this slow oscillation between the primary and secondary areas. Um, another uh, well-known large-scale model is that of uh, Izikiewicz and uh, Edelman. So um, this was, uh, in terms of the number of synapses, it's about a factor of 100 larger than the other model. Um, they used white matter connectivity from um, human diffusion tensor imaging, DTI. So it's a magnetic resonance uh, based method. And um, the, the six layered cortex, um, the individual uh, circuits, so the local connectivity was based on an extensive study from uh, cat visual cortex, where uh, this uh, Binzecker, he made morphological reconstructions of, uh, of uh, neurons in uh, each layer, so of, of different types, excitatory, inhibitory, uh, uh, spiny stellate, pyramidal, etc., cetera. Um, and um, based on so-called Peters's rule, so that, um, or some variant thereof, um, estimated the population level connectivity. So that's, that's based on um, uh, the size of the exonal uh, and dendritic trees and how many overlaps they have, and then assuming that uh, on the population level, the number of synapses is proportional to the number of overlaps between exonal and uh, dendritic trees, which appears to work reasonably well uh, on the population level. Um, then, uh, so this is also a very complex model. There's a folded cortical structure, 22 neuron types, uh, different spiking behaviors, uh, AMPA, NMDA, GABA-A, and GABA-B synapses. So this is a, a slow inhibition, fast inhibition, uh, fast excitation and, and, and slow excitation. Um, Short-term plasticity and spike timing dependent plasticity, uh, dendritic spikes, and uh, it was implemented in C and it was uh, already quite a bit faster than the previous model. Um, but this, this model is, uh, it's very rich in terms of uh, all the components that went into it, but the, uh, mm, the predictions it, it makes are just uh, simple ones, like uh, propagating activity on the cortical surface, um, a sensitive dependence on initial conditions, so um, um, an aspect of chaos was shown in, in this model, and um, delta, alpha and beta oscillations, and local gamma rhythms, but without showing a spectra or a, compa a direct comparison uh, with uh, experimental data. So it remains sort of a yeah, proof of principle. Um, yeah, now I'll uh, get to our models. Um, the model that we are developing is based on um, uh, a cortical microcircuit model that was developed by uh, Pochans and, and my boss, uh, Markus Diesmann. Um, and it uh, has uh, four layers, so layer two and three are grouped. Uh, they have similar properties. Layer one is not included because it contains only very few neurons. And then there's layers uh, four, five, and six, an excitatory and an inhibitory population in each of these layers. <coughs> mm. And um, it's basically a generalization of uh, the well-known balanced random network model. So each of these layers is a balanced random network model. Um, that is um, a model where um, it, uh, it has a um, certain connection probability and then the neurons are otherwise connected at random and um, the inhibition is strong enough to, uh, to cause asynchronous irregular spiking activity. Um, the, the model uh, describes about one square millimeter of cortical surface. It has a full density of neurons and synapses within this uh, area, which is around uh, 80,000 neurons and 300 million synapses. And um, for simplicity, the E and I neurons are assumed to have identical intrinsic dynamics, which is uh, not the case in uh, actual cortex, but this is a, a simplification to focus more on the connectivity of the model. And then um, 
so the connectivity is laterally uh, homogeneous. The neurons are not uh, located in, in space, if you will. Um, but um, the connection probabilities between all these uh, populations um, are population specific and uh, derived from an extensive survey of the um, experimental literature. And uh, what the model does is it, it uh, just predicts the spike rates in the different layers and populations. It predicts a higher activity in the inhibitory uh, populations than in the excitatory ones. So inhibitory spikes are here shown in, in red and the excitatory ones in, in blue. Um, and this despite them having uh, the same uh, intrinsic properties. So that means that it's due to the, the connectivity that the inhibitory neurons spike faster. Um, and uh, the low firing rates in layer two, three, and the highest firing rates in layer five. Um, and uh, this model is, uh, is used as uh, already, it's been taken up by several groups and it's uh, publicly available. Um, in our model, we have 32 uh, areas. It's uh, following the classic parcellation of Fellerman and von Essen of all vision-related areas of macaque uh, cortex. So we chose the macaque because there's, uh, it's relatively similar to the human, even though its brain is still quite a bit smaller and it has fewer regions, etc. But um, um, and there is uh, really a lot of data available for this system, so it's a good example system to help understand uh, relationships between cortical structure and uh, dynamics uh, more generally. Um, because uh, we still cannot uh, simulate this full system, uh, we represent each of these 32 areas by one such uh, square millimeter microcircuit. And that leads to a total of 4 million neurons and 24 billion synapses. Um, the, um, this uh, microcircuit model um, was uh, based on uh, cat and rat uh, data and also on early sensory cortex. Um, but all the cortical areas are a little bit different. They have different uh, layer thicknesses and um, neuron densities. So we um, adjust the, this microcircuit model to each of these 32 areas according to their uh, um, measured neuron densities, laminar thicknesses, and statistical estimates for where there are missing data. Um, but what we preserve relative to this uh, microcircuit model is uh, the relative uh, in degrees. So in degrees are the uh, numbers of incoming synapses per neuron for each pair of populations. Um, and um, the cortical cortical connectivity is based on exonal tracing data, and we have distance dependent inter area delays, and also uh, all the neurons receive an external Poisson drive to account for the parts of the brain that we are not explicitly modeling. Um, the the model is implemented in uh, using uh, Nest uh, with its its uh, sort of native language called Sly. Um, it runs, it can run on a high performance compute cluster, but uh, we usually run it on the Uqueen supercomputer in, in Uli uh, with uh, around a thousand MPI processes, also multi threading, um, and it takes a few minutes for one second of simulation, so there's a slowdown factor of a few hundred. Um, we have um, run larger versions, but those are not really manageable to do science with because the, the turnover rate is, is low and they also actually use up a lot of um, uh, energy. The largest um, possible version that uh, we estimated is about uh, 500 million neurons, so half a billion on the full U queen. And that's uh, close to, but not quite, the total number of neurons in one hemisphere of uh, macaque vision-related cortex. Um, when you define a model in such a bottom-up way, just putting lots of experimental data together, uh, what usually happens is that initially you don't get uh, reasonable activity. Uh, and so uh, neither did we. Uh, we found that um, 
there's uh, either uh, low activity or high activity. The activity here in this uh, state is, uh, is excessive. Here it's more reasonable, but um, the excitatory populations in layers five and six um, have very low activity, a bit too low. So then you could think, okay, we want to, we just uh, increase the external drive onto them. We don't uh, know exactly what it should be anyway. But when we uh, did that, then the model quickly went to this state again. Uh, and so um, with the help of some others from, uh, from our institute, uh, we formulated um, a mean field reduction of this model that could predict the average firing rates in each of the populations. Um, and based on that, um, predicted um, how to change the uh, connectivity just slightly and uh, increase this uh, stability of this low activity fixed point such that we could increase the external drive onto the uh, um, excitatory populations in layers five and six and still um, not go to the high activity state. So what this does, um, this is illustrated for, for two populations here. We have 254, but um, so there's a low activity fixed point and a high activity fixed point, and there's a separatrix between them. And in the simulations, we have fluctuations that can stochastically uh, bring the model across the separatrix to this state, which we don't want. Um, when we increase the external drive, um, then uh, the low activity fixed point becomes better, is improved, but at the same time, uh, the separatrix moves closer to it, so that smaller fluctuations already bring the activity to the high activity state. Um, and what this mean field-based method does is to uh, move the separatrix back to its original position, and it only slightly uh, reduces the activity of the low activity state again, and we still have reasonable activity. Um, but this, does a, this method also predicts some changes in, um, um, in connectivity, and one of the main changes is uh, reduced connectivity in this loop between these frontal areas, which is uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the frontal eye field. And um, this could be because there's just uncertainty um, in the experimental data. There are all kinds of mappings going on where that uh, increased uh, uncertainty, but also um, in higher areas. Um, uh, so, so we use this uh, square millimeter microcircus everywhere, but the um, mm, areas also differ in terms of sort of the lateral range of their, of their connectivity and how large a microcircuit you should actually consider probably. And um, this could be related to this. Um, as a sanity check, um, we looked at the community structure of this model, of the area level graph, and uh, just saw that uh, there are reasonable clusters in the connectivity. Uh, so the, the frontal regions cluster together, and then here you have uh, parahippocampal areas, um, early visual areas. Here you have the, the ventral stream that is involved in object recognition, and the um, dorsal stream areas that uh, are involved in recognition of of movement. Um, here's some simulation results, just showing um, so raster plots, the so spiking activity for three of the 32 areas. Your uh, uh, primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and the frontal eye field. And what you see uh, compared to the microcircuit model is that there are now these vertical stripes of different widths, so this sort of population burst of activity. And this is this uh, um, yeah, slow, fluctuations um, that were not present in, in just an isolated microcircuit that are due to the interactions between the areas. And um, we also um, <coughs> compared with um, parallel spike train recordings from primary visual cortex and uh, compared the, the spectra of the activity and also the distribution of uh, spike rates across neurons. And um, they, they match nicely. Um, and uh, another um, aspect that you see is that there's sort of burst your spiking wider, um, yeah, that corresponds to wider or, uh, um, autocorrelation functions in the higher areas. And that um, seems to be related to the fact that in, um, in higher areas you have um, 
lower neuron densities, but the uh, volume density of synapses is, uh, is more constant across areas, and that causes neurons in the higher areas to receive more synapses per neuron. And it also increases the, uh, uh, the variability of their inputs, and that uh, is it seems to be related to this uh, sort of um, burst here spiking, but we're investigating this. Um, another aspect of the model is that it predicts that the, the model should be, the network should be in a metastable state in order to reproduce the experimental findings. And um, what we did is um, we varied the strength of the cortical cortical synapses, so the uh, synapses between areas. Uh, and when the, those uh, synaptic weights are low, then you have asynchronous irregular spiking in all the areas. You don't have any um, uh, interactions between the areas or uh, just uh, small interactions. And then when you increase these um, synaptic weights, then at some point you get this activity that I showed um, that matches the experimental uh, data. When you increase them further, then you go to this, uh, to this high activity state. And um, so it's illustrated here that uh, at exactly the right point, then um, the activity sort of fluctuates around this uh, low activity fixed point, and it goes quite close to the instability, and here close to it, the uh, activity slows down and the, um, these uh, synchronized uh, fluctuations uh, appear. Um, we also looked at the propagation of the activity across the areas, and um, it appears to, um, uh, it propagates mainly in the feedback direction, so from the higher areas to the lower areas, and that uh, sort of matches experimental data um, from uh, the visual imagery, so where subjects were not uh, looking at uh, images, but they were imagining them, or also during uh, sleep. So it sort of makes sense that um, our model is not uh, processing any visual inputs, it's maybe uh, daydreaming. So um, finally, we um, compared uh, the correlations between the areas with uh, functional connectivity from fMRI. So functional connectivity are basically also correlations. Um, uh, in fMRI, the activity is, is, uh, has been found to, uh, to reflect the synaptic inputs more than the spiking outputs, and so we also compared with uh, correlations between the synaptic inputs to the different areas, and then um, uh, ordered the areas according to these uh, clusters that are there in the, um, and you see that there's a match between uh, these clusters here, and we also quantified the correspondence between the simulated and uh, experimental data. Um, and for these intermediate uh, inter-area synaptic weights, the match uh, is, is the best. Uh, the correlation between the two matrices is a little bit above 0.4. And it exceeds the um, correlation between the structural connectivity matrix and the experimental functional connectivity. So that uh, says that actually uh, the, the dynamics of our simulations add something to the predictions. Um, what our model also allows it uh, um, is to, to characterize paths uh, through the network. And then uh, we have these three categories here. This roughly feed forward, uh, lateral connections, and feedback connections between areas. Uh, and it's well known that these feed forward patterns, they go from layer two, three uh, to layer four. Uh, and that's also in our model. That's not surprising. Um, but uh, so structurally, these uh, lateral paths are, uh, look like the feed forward paths, but uh, dynamically here, based on Granger causality analysis, um, they look like a mixture between feed forward and feedback. And uh, also here, uh, we predict that uh, the feedback uh, is mostly, um, dynamically, uh, is most influential from layer five to layer six, whereas in the structure, um, there's much more uh, complexity. Um, 
So what this says is that uh, you cannot uh, um, predict based on the structure alone or directly um, which uh, pathways are going to be used the most. Um, uh, overall, the um, Granger uh, causality was stronger onto the inhibitory populations than onto the excitatory ones, which uh, seems to make sense because we need to, the model to be stable, so it, it needs to be inhibition dominated. And um, what this shows is a distribution of, uh, of um, connection densities for uh, the, the projections between areas here and uh, within areas that, that tend to be denser. Uh, and then the parts of them that, uh, that are significant according to uh, the Granger causality analysis at a particular uh, significance level, um, here 5%. Uh, and you see that um, it, uh, the denser connections are more likely to become significant, but still uh, some sparse, relatively sparse connections also become significant. And this just it depends on the, the actual activity of the populations, whether they become dynamically uh, relevant or not. So if a population is more active, it sends more output, you know, or if it's uh, also on the input side, um, the susceptibility to inputs changes depending on the firing rate of the, of the neurons. Um, so to summarize, um, neural network models can test and uh, also suggest hypotheses on, on mechanisms underlying brain activity and also its changes in neurological conditions. Um, including interactions between brain regions and, and realistic numbers of neurons and synapses enhances the the self-consistency of such models. Um, and um, at, at present, it's still very difficult to, to, to properly constrain uh, such models, as you saw. Uh, but a number of models are being developed that can serve as a basis for, for future work, and um, including also functional properties, learning. And uh, I think the main point is that we need to uh, build on existing work and not each uh, start a new model. And uh, this is exactly what the Human Brain Project is also um, uh, promoting and, um, and facilitating. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my former PhD student, uh, Maximilian Schmidt. He did most of the development of the multi-area model. And um, Rembrandt Bakker helped with, uh, so he's a curator of the COCMAC database for uh, exonal tracing data on macaque. Yannis um, and helped with uh, mean field theory. We received fMRI data from Kelly Shen and Gleb Beskin. And Klaus Hegetag and Markus Diesmann were also involved um, in, this, uh, in the multi-area model and Markus Diesmann more generally throughout. So uh, that was it from my side. Uh, any questions?